Hello, and, uh, and welcome. Um, I am Paul Lewis, good evening. Um, I'm Paul Lewis, I'm the president of the Architectural League, and I'm very pleased to introduce this unique and important event appropriately entitled New Grounds for Design Education. The past two months have witnessed the emergence of a radical rethinking of architectural education, a necessary and needed challenge to the dominance of whiteness in the design disciplines, particularly in architecture, whose history, curriculum, and values have been explicitly and implicitly defined by whiteness. It is a demand for social justice, inclusion, and for reforms to combat racism in our schools. This challenge has been spearheaded by thousands of students, faculty, and alumni who have protested, signed letters, and demanded action. And the League is honored to be able to be a partner with the New York Review of Architecture to provide a platform for tonight's discussion, a discussion among some of the letter organizers. And it must be stated that there are many more schools that could be presenting, presenting tonight, save for the limits of Zoom and time. I want to thank all of you who are gathered uh, tonight uh, to especially thank the panelists from the 15 schools, to thank our moderator, Sanjeev Vijja, chair of the New York City College of Technology, who has been a much needed voice for ethical and inclusive reforms in architectural education and a constant source of clarion and provocative advice. Currently, the League cannot gather people physically, but we can gather people from across the country. In this Zoom audience, roughly a third of you are students, a third are faculty, and a third are alumni. And for those of you who are in the class of 2020, the Architectural League will also be hosting a series of conversations entitled Reimagine, specifically to bring very recent graduates into conversation with each other during the month of September to reimagine your agency in these times of converging crises. Lastly, lastly allow me to thank Nicholas Kemper, and the Review of Architecture uh, for coordinating tonight's large gathering and critical conversation. Nicholas, uh, I hand the Zoom screen over to you. Hi, um, hello, welcome to tonight's event, uh, New Grounds for Education. Um, some practical matters, uh, please introduce yourself uh, in the Zoom chat right now um, and say where you're from. Uh, we will be recording tonight's session uh, beware, and as we have so many panelists and audience members, I would encourage everyone to ask and answer questions using the Q&A tool, uh, chat, as well as the main discussion, um, so that we can have kind of side conversations going as well. I see people already going to the chat, that's fantastic. Um, and as we have so many here, I will try and keep my remarks short. I am Nicholas Kemper, the publisher of the New York Review of Architecture. Um, I would like to thank Han Lei, who made the poster for tonight. I would also like to thank uh, Katarina Flaxman and Nanase uh, Shirakawa, who have helped, uh, been helping organize this event from the Architectural League side. Um, though the review is, of course, an integral and venerable part of New York, um, we published our first issue in May 2019. We are actually only a little more than a year old. Uh, we chose a name that is straightforward about what we do and what we are so we can make ourselves accessible to a wider public, but while our name may be venerable, the publication we are building is actually deeply unusual. Uh, what does that mean? It means instead of answering to a single owner or board of donors, we are working to organize as a member-owned cooperative. It means that though our editors and I are still volunteers, we have paid all of our contributors from issue one, not enough as we would like, but we are committed to building something that does not depend solely on the whims of big donors and free labor, uh, but rather um, has members and subscribers who value our work enough to support it and contributors whose work we value by supporting them. Uh, it means we take the review to mean no propaganda. Uh, contributors cannot write about their own work. Finally, it means we see ourselves not as a mountain, but rather as part of a forest. We seek in everything we do to operate within and grow an ecosystem, a thick bundle of sister organizations. We have sent correspondents to cover lectures and conferences across almost all of New York's architecture institutions. And we freely and happily list events put on by all of these organizations and more on our website um, and distribute them in our weekly email. Um, the panel gathered tonight is emblematic of that approach. Moderating tonight's discussion is Sanjeev Vedia. Sanjeev is the Chair of Architectural Technology at City Tech uh, College and Institution that embodies the promise of a public design education. 
Of its 700 undergraduate students, 40% are born outside of the US, 58% come from households earning less than $30,000 a year, and 25% work more than 20 hours a week. 85% um, identify as students of color. Also asking questions of the discussants, of the discussants is Dr. Sharon Sutton, uh, who in 1976 became the 12th African-American woman to be licensed to practice architecture, in 1994 became the first to be promoted to full professor of architecture, and is the author of When the Ivory Towers Were Black, a story about race in America's cities and universities. With the help of the Architectural League, Designers Protest, and numerous other organizations, we have gathered here organizers from 15 different schools. They have all shown courage and tenacity in standing up to demand their respective institutions do better. Um, they have helped organize tonight collaboratively. I would like to um, credit Mian uh, Wynn for suggesting the excellent name, New Grounds for Design Education. They have gathered here to compare experiences, talk about next steps, and field questions from the audience. Um, as progress is a process, not an event, we at the Review and the League are committed to helping organize another conversation in three months in October as a check-in. I also want to be uh, transparent about how these panelists came together. Uh, we asked a few and then left the door open for additional panelists to sign up. Some have pointed out we do not have any organizers from design programs from historically black colleges and universities an oversight for which I take responsibility, and we will make sure to reach out to them in future conversations. Our program, uh, one program declined to participate in tonight's conversation, Princeton, but they did submit the following statement to be read. The organizers at Princeton University would like to lend their support to this panel and hope to work with, um, to work with you all and join this conversation shortly. We are not participating today as we are at the very beginning stages of our work within the school, unsure of what our standing is with our dean and administration, and thus not ready to discuss our process in public uh, should anyone re want to reach out, um, I will be putting their email into the chat. Um, before I think, turn things over to Sanjeev and disappear for the rest of the evening, as we ask the schools that form the backbone of our architectural profession to do better, we at the Review also promise to do better. Uh, though we are small and young, we at the Review, um, our own editorial ranks have lacked diversity. Um, I am pale male and I went to Yale. Uh, in the next several weeks, we will be launching a recruitment push for new editors. As we form that team, we promise to make it more reflective of the city and society we seek to serve. If you're interested in supporting our mission, please consider subscribing, donating, writing for us, or applying to be an editor. Get in, in touch at editor at nyra.nyc. We are eager to hear from you. And now, without any more ado, Sanjeev. All right, thank you. Um, do you want, can you hear me there, uh, Nicholas, and shall we have everyone? Uh... Yeah, everybody should go ahead and turn on their camera. Right. All right, so it looks like while well, people are turning on their, their cameras and it looks like we're still, the attendee number still seems to be rising, which is a, uh, a good thing. Um, I just want to add a few um, thanks and some notes for the format of tonight's conversation. This is a really um, uh, urgent and I think a very uh, timely conversation um, but it's also a little bit of an experiment here because uh, it's quite a few participants, um, which is a good sign. It means that there's a lot of people with uh, a lot of urgency and a lot of important things to say. So um, I want to start by saying thanks to the Arch Architectural League of New York, Rosalie, and Paul, Katerina, uh, Manasse. I think that um, the work they do in highlighting uh, practices that are not commonly recognized and adding an intellectual conversation to the practice of architecture, design, and art uh, has benefited our students immensely. And I'm, I'm really grateful for their support um, and, and really helping to host and set up this event. Um, I'm also grateful to the New York Review of Architecture, Nicholas Kemper, um, for putting all this together. I think that's a really uh, we were surprised this is, had not happened before uh, because of all the collaboration and discussions between students. So I think this is a really important thing um, that we're doing here today. Uh, it's fitting to me that this discussion takes place on the day um, of 
uh, Representative John Lewis's memory uh, and his memorial service, I think that that's really bodes well for a fruitful conversation. Um, from reading the letters, uh, I, I was very hopeful. And then based on the questions I received from the audience and the participants, um, I see preparations for good trouble. So I think that that's a honorable day to have this type of forum. Um, I'm also grateful for the presence of Dr. Uh, Sharon Sutton. Her experience and research are really important for this discussion. Um, the first question about uh, for this for this group is about comparing experiences or responses responses from administration so far. But I want to sharpen the question and set some parameters. There are about 33 panelists, uh, so I want to ask each of them to be very brief, to be to the point. Um, we're going to create and treat this as a very safe space, a forum for what should be and must be an honest and candid conversation. Um, the letters from the designers and architects deserve this level of honesty um, and certainly the urgency of this forum. I also want to leave time for Dr. Sutton's questions and in particular her detailed analysis of the protest letters um, that she's done, which is absolutely brilliant along with audience questions. There were, there were something like 60 audience questions. Uh, each one is incredible. Each one is really uh, provocative and we need to leave some time for that. So beware, I will interrupt you. Um, I ask for your forgiveness and forbearance in, a, in advance. Do not be offended. Um, there's a lot of people here, a lot of things to say. So to set the first conversation, I wanna tell you what I, what I think and. Um, what I keep bringing to the table in my role as the chair of, of um, the New York City College of Technology, a, a sort of an underdog of the architectural education. Um, and as Nicholas mentioned, about 85% of our students identify as, as students of color. We are Hispanic serving institutions. And if you look at our numbers compared to almost any one of the um, major architectural colleges, uh, you will see that we have DEI, we have diversity, um, and inclusion pretty well um, covered. What we don't have is money, and that has really uh, lit a fire under me to, to participate and sort of stand ground and yell and scream about the inequities in education and how we need to motivate a lot of students to get involved. Um, what I think is at stake is the relevance of our profession. Uh, it's a debate about scarcity, austerity versus abundance. For example, uh, the 20 private colleges with well-oiled marketing machinery hold an endowment of over $600 billion, right? That's, a, that's an incredible amount of money. The Black Student Alliance at, at GSEP wrote in their essay on the futility of listening that the administration must recognize that pedagogy is political and has sociocultural obligation. Neutrality is a political stance untenable and unsustainable. Private colleges are in fact run like corporations, but deans are not CEOs and they may have little of power to affect change being requested. It is why perhaps that the responses from the deans are tepid retreats to listening better or asking for further data analysis before taking action, as if these might be extraneous to the mission of education. Um, Dr. Sutton remarks on a very similar idea in her analysis of all the letters, uh, which I thought was pretty important. Um, and she writes that many of them appeal to the administration and in doing so relinquish agency and transfer it to the white people who are then to solve the problem that they themselves created. So within that context, uh, let's start the discussion on institutional or academic impact of your campaigns. Have there been any positive surprises, disappointments, um, but within the following five areas that I want to focus a little bit more on. Number one, public acknowledgement of the pain, wrongdoings, and injustices of the school on past uh, BIPOC students and communities. Two, <clears throat> a call on the college to advocate for the end of contractual partnerships with police and for ceasing the use of prison labor on campus. Three, uh, allocation of funding to invest in hiring and supporting the black faculty staff administration. Uh, and BIPOC fellows. Four, dismantling white supremacy in studio. Five, student-driven plans in the face of administrative non-response. All of you, if you're current students or alum, well, if you're current students, you're certainly limited to four years of work, five years in the BRH program. 
Um, how is it that you'll get the next generation of, of students to lead? How can we have a long-term um, response, long-term active uh, protest? All right, so that's my two seconds of setting the terms of the conversation. Um, I'd like to start by uh, opening it up to the um, participants here. I'm also very grateful for their time and taking the time to do this. Um, I would ask that each of you just introduce yourselves uh, as you go through and, and, um, and make your response to any one of those five areas, um, positive responses, disappointments, uh, plans for that. Let me start, I'm just gonna go through the top of my list here. Uh, Emily Ebersol from Taubman. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for uh, putting this event on. Uh, I'm here representing the University of Michigan um, with Serena Brewer. So if you want to say hi to Serena. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, um, I think as far as greatest impact has just really been on a uh, larger scale in terms of mobilizing as a school, you know, um, as we know, these conversations and this fight is not new by any means, and um, it's not new to Taubman by any means as well. And so um, organizations like NOMAS, uh, our DEI plan and faculty um, who have been forefronting racial equity in their research and forces, you know, these things are already happening. And so I, I would say the greatest impact has been to see all of these people and organizations uh, really linking together under the umbrella of the DJA and um, from all corners of the college and really coming together as one. Uh, Serena, do you wanna follow up on that or continue with that train of thought since you're also coming in from Taubman? Yes, um, definitely. Um, I agree with Emily 100%. Thank you all for having me here, by the way. Um, we are continuing on the work that many of our predecessors have laid the groundwork for. But I think what we're trying to do, and in response to, I think, maybe the fourth point that um, you uh, mentioned, um, we're trying to get this institutionalized um, into the university and combat white supremacy within our predominantly white institution. Um, that's our main focus as of right now. I think this will be an ever-evolving um, issue and an ever-evolving campaign that we hope to continue throughout the next foreseeable future. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we're trying to take the architecture profession um, and give it a sense of responsibility um, for its BIPOC voices, yeah. So let me ask you a question, um, Serena. If the uh, Talman has a five-year diversity plan, and I believe uh, what I read is that you're in year five of that. Do you have any um, numbers or data that you can tell us? I mean, part of that plan was to allocate funds to hire black faculty and staff. Um, are there results? Do you see that they've done so and made these type of changes? Um, well, we've worked really closely with our chief diversity officer, Shawana Dos Santos. Um, and I think she's on this call right now. She helped us um, formulate the letter um, and bring it to the rest of the administration. Um, I would say we are working towards um, hiring and sustaining and tenuring our black faculty. I think that's a constant struggle. Um, I would say there has been strides that have been made. They have focused on hiring practices and they have focused on um, re readjusting some of the um, tenure process. Um, but I, I, unfortunately, I don't know all the, the details of everything that's gone through the DEI plan from the first year. This is my second year at Taubman. So um, yeah, I would say, I think there's a lot more still to be done. There are a hundred actionable items on our DEI plan for this upcoming year. And we will be working extremely diligently to um, get those completed. Got it. So, so um, I'm getting text messages and some information here as well. So I think maybe we should break this down into um, uh, maybe start with the public acknowledgement of the pain and the wrongdoings. Um, that seems to be already a very significant um, starting point for the conversation. So I guess um, Virginia Tech, 
Aria Hill wanted to uh, maybe address that right away. Yeah, um, so my name is Aria Hill. I am currently a fourth year student in the BARC program. And I'm also the current NOMIS at Virginia Tech president. I'd say in response to your question about acknowledgement of pain, I think our Dean, Dean Richard Blythe of our College of Architecture um, did, a, did a good job of acknowledging um, some of the um, current, but also past justices uh, in our, and I think that our new director, Aaron Betsky, um, he, um, in response to our statement, um, took it upon himself to um, really shake things up in our school uh, ever since our statement was released almost two months ago. Um, changes in leadership have um, been um, really great. I think um, he did a really good job of um, bringing in new leadership. Uh, we have all new leaders of all of our undergraduate, graduate programs, but also um, uh, new faculty members as well. So I think in that sense, in the hiring of faculty um, and dealing with it at that level, um, we're at a good place right now. And I think um, Director Betsky has a lot of good plans for us right now. All right, that's good. That's really, um, it's good to hear. I, I wanna go to Cecily Hill. Hi everyone, my name is Cecily and I am a rising second year master's in urban planning student at Harvard GSD. Um, and I'm here with Jaylene as well. She, a landscape student and she'll talk later, I'm sure. But um, I think also our school has done a pretty good job. Um, I know Sarah Whiting has done, you know, she responded to our notes on credibility letter almost like immediately after we sent it. Um, and then Mark Lee, our chair of the architecture department also kind of went back on his earlier statements that were sort of anti-black, but you know, he had the opportunity to rectify that. Um, so I think the school has done a good job of recognizing that like anti-racist curriculum is not anti-black racist curriculum and that there's a necessary difference there. Um, but I do think overall and like in this instance, we need to recognize that all of this is a product of unpaid black labor and that there needs to be hiring opportunities for the students who are involved in this process and are currently in meetings and in talks like this who um, are spending hours each week to rebuild a curriculum that has been in place and and there is so much unwillingness still um, by some members of the of the this field to change it but there needs to be I think more opportunity to to acknowledge what work has been done by black students and um, so like there are talks that are happening but I do think that um, there's one shortcoming that I've seen across the board in many different spaces because I mean, architects don't exist in a monolith and like this is not our only only job. So I think there's a lot of capacity building that needs to be done. All right, um, thank you for that. I wanna uh, go to Taya Wynn. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> um, so I am an alumna of Syracuse University and also the Weitzman School, which is, uh, used to be formerly Penn Design when I was there. Um, I've mostly been engaging Syracuse kind of in recent months. Um, and there's a large group of alumni. Uh, a few have been really active in some other affiliated organiza organizations like um, NOMA and AIA. Um, and, but there's a larger, broader group of BIPOC alumni that had come together uh, to try to discuss some of the shifts that we've seen over the years. A lot of issues have been going on at Syracuse, which I think uh, one of the current students, DJ, will probably address later. But I'm sure many of you saw a lot of the CNN reports and the news reports about all of the unrest, especially the racial unrest that had been happening at Syracuse over the last year. So we had already kind of been starting to engage the student population. Um, and one thing that became really important as the alumni base was making sure that we started to create stronger connections ourselves to the student base um, and trying to figure out how as alumni we can help amplify and uplift their voices and connect them to better resources um, on the ground as they're the ones that are kind of dealing with a lot of the issues that we all faced during school or currently facing in school every day. Got it, okay. Um... DJ Butler, did you want to follow up on that? 
Yes, thank you. Um, and just to elaborate on Ty's point about um, a lot of what many of you may have heard about what was going on at Syracuse University this past year, uh, before this current year's, um, you know, just uproar of you know, just racial discriminatory acts, um, Syracuse faced a lot of its own, and, and NOMA, in which I'm the current president at Syracuse, took on the initiative just to continue to, you know, make our students aware. Um, while the university is predominantly white, the Syracuse architecture uh, student population is, is very much a global population. It's represented by 70 plus different countries. Um, home of which many are not familiar with just, you know, just racial discrimination. Um, and we saw that experience um, firsthand and how students were um, pretty much engaged and as well as di disengaged um, and just understanding what racism looks like. So um, NOMA took the initiative just to, just to make students aware of um, discrimination and white supremacy, um, et cetera. Um, and thankfully enough, that allowed our student, global student population to begin to rally behind uh, the NOMAS movement that was occurring, you know, within the Slocum, Slocum Hall, uh, which obviously, you know, allowed our alumni, and I'm so thankful for the Syracuse alumni who uh, came back and supported um, the local NOMA chapter because they, that fuel also um, allowed them a lot of the influence that NOMAS was putting out for you know, anti-racial discrimination to go forward um, and have, you know, slowly but surely have the faculty and staff uh, begin to make the necessary changes. And while they're still a work in progress, um, the influence simply started by just making our global population aware of, you know, racial discrimination and standing alongside that no one that will be discriminated against. So, so DJ, I want to I want to um, push back on your comments here. Okay, uh, I'm going to read you a quote. One of my favorite quotes from um, uh, Charles Blow. And he says, think about the time and energy you put into explaining things that do not need to be explained. Think about the idea that time, energy, and passion are limited commodities in life. Every moment I spend trying to drag someone out of the cave is a moment that I've taken away from loving my family, doing my work, being in my community, reading books, elevating myself and the people around me. And so I say to you, I refuse to give you any of my time. I refuse to give that to you because you are taking it away from me. To put onto the oppressed the burden of fixing the defect in the oppressor is another layer of oppression. So I ask you, is that, how would you respond to that? Do you think it's still your responsibility to explain this? Um. I find myself, and I, I thank you for that question. I find myself just in, in the at the at the peak of a lot of frustration, and you know, me being you know African American, black male, especially at a, especially at a university like Syracuse, you know, finding myself in a place where I was like, you know what, I don't feel like you know having to explain how to treat me, you know, as a person, how to just be a, a simple, you know, human who has an understanding of kindness being genuine, being compassionate, being empathetic. Sometimes I, I, I do have moments where I feel like I don't, I don't, I don't need to, but at the same time, that, that isn't what our, that isn't what black culture has done. You know, we step up and rise to that occasion to be like, hey, look, our voice and our thoughts are heard. You know, if, if I'm passionate about, hey, just understanding that I want to be treated in a certain way, that, that fire and that vigor won't allow my silence to remain silent. Um, so while I get tired and, and I'm human and I get frustrated, I bounce out of that and I step back in place to do what needs to be done. And that's what, that's what social justice is about. It's not just about me, it's about those around me and how I, I can encourage those to understand that, you know, while we're different, you know, we can come together outside of our own tiredness and self to help for a better cause for a later day. Let me, let me stop you there. I've got to go to Natalia Rivello uh, of UPenn. Natalia, are you there? Yeah, hi. I'm Natalia Rivello Rota. I'm from UPenn. I'm a third year of MRC, and I'm here with Hillary Morales. Um, we help write the, uh, the letter. The biggest thing for us um, in terms of public acknowledgement of oppression or even just public acknowledgement and transparency, that's been the biggest issue for us. We have been approached by administration. We have been approached by uh, members of the architecture faculty, landscape faculty, but there's still a lot of information that hasn't been communicated to students. 
um, as a larger population. And it's a little bit of a slow process that, I, that we're trying to battle with as well, because we understand they're trying to take their time and do it correctly and, and, and not just do symbolic um, actions. But at the same time, there's a lot of students that don't know what's happening. And to me, that's been the biggest push that we've been trying to get. How can we, not just us as inclusion and design, but also get the administration to publish what they're planning to do, get everybody else on board and kind of just be transparent about it. Um, I'll let Hillary add a little bit more as well. Hi, my name is Hillary Morales. I'm doing a dual master's in architecture and history preservation at Penn. Uh, I think in my experience so far is working along with the student body because uh, uh, we don't have a, a lot of uh, representation of black community in our institution. Like our year specifically, there's non-black students. So we were like considering like why like this is happening. What is the lack of representation of these different communities since Philadelphia, the most of the communities around it is black communities. So what is happening? Why these our institutions are not inviting these people? Right. Uh, so. We're trying to uh, join forces between the different student bodies that exist within white sensual design, because there's no, uh, the only one that can represent all, uh, all of us is inclusion design so far. So we're doing like a lot of questioning like uh, with the administration, why, what they are the efforts to, uh, to make more approachable design to other uh, groups or communities uh, close to Penn. Um, but that's like for so far what I've been close because uh, uh, something that I was admired so far with all, with all these processes is how the student body responsiveness and alumni is being so fast but the administration has uh, having a very slow and bureaucratic process but is um, so for us it's like how we can be more demanding and get results as an, an urgent character and also questioning if there's a priority in making these changes as soon as possible. Right, I think that's, I think that's a, a, a good comment. I wanna go um, to uh, Shane, Shane at University of Florida. Hopefully I'm saying your name correctly. Hi, uh, yes, it's Shane Asiong and um, I'm from the University of Florida. I uh, graduated last year my undergrad in architecture along with uh, Jalisa Mills and Rachel Chong, who are also present on the panel. Uh, we submitted a letter to the School of Architecture three weeks ago and have uh, received a, a very uh, fast response from the school and uh, have been meeting with the director of the school and a member of the faculty that represents the whole of the faculty uh, every week since. It's, uh, and um, so far, the response has been positive, um, but also it's very hard, as you might know, to implement change and really organize in a timely manner um, and actually set uh, action, the actionable items in a uh, set timeline. Uh, with that said, we are uh, working with uh, previous alumni from other years including Jan Sfilokos, who invited us to this panel, and uh, his uh, year 2011, and also other years. But our letter was also crafted with accounts of racism and discrimination by multiple people of uh, my graduation year and the year below us as well. So it really has been um, a really good start to start up the conversation of racism and also inclusive to the LGBTQIA members of the architecture schools. Um, and um, we are on a good path. I'm very positive about what is going to happen in the few years, but we are also um, trying to reformat the, um, the role of uh, the current diversity inclusion officer or uh, trying to hire a new diversity inclusion officer. At the yeah, that, that's certainly an important role to have at any of the colleges. Um, we need to move on to the next question, but before we do, uh, you know, reading the letters, I, I was surprised that none of the students or the participants have mentioned um, House Resolution 40. Um, this has come up on my mind a lot when, when I was reading through the letters, which is, a conversation on reparations, because it seems to me 
that a lot of, of you are demanding of your institutions acknowledgement of crimes against indigenous, indigenous people, um, people of color, black Americans, black citizens. I mean, this, this is an amazing conversation. So I put it out there, I'm, I'm now leading uh, with this idea, but it seems to me that maybe all these schools should be, uh, start a campaign to write to your congressman or woman to advocate for that. Because I think, I'm not sure, and I, I push back to you, I don't know if your college is gonna do that, right? I still assert that a college is a corporation. Um, and getting them to acknowledge wrongdoing uh, has will have limited returns. It might happen on a classroom level or a small, uh, you know, departmental level, but certainly not enough to explain to a larger audience. So um, I'm going to move on to uh, my second question. I'm getting prompted by Nicholas uh, on the side here. Um, we call on the college to advocate for the end of contractual partnerships with police and for ceasing the use of prison labor. Um, on campus. And I think that uh, I want to go to uh, Alice uh, at Cooper Union. Uh, hi, I'm Alisa Petrosova. I'm in the School of Art at Cooper and I'm the founder of um, the Cooper Climate Coalition. I think I'm the only non-architect on this panel. Um, at Cooper, we have um, received a response from the school and from also the security, um, the head of security at Cooper to, um, that we will be seizing um, our relationships and our contracts with the NYPD. We've also hosted events in the Great Hall with the NYPD where we've rented that out. And I think the letter um, back from the school, I'm here with Sanjana. I don't know if Sanjana wants to say anything else in terms of this response. Um, yeah, I think, uh, hi, I'm Sundana. I'm a, an architecture student at Cooper Union, about to enter my fourth year. Um, so yeah, like Elisa said, uh, the letter did address Cooper's relationship with the NYPD, uh, not simply uh, not simply the use of the Great Hall for public events, um, but also access to uh, police officers uh, to campus facilities such as bathrooms and public spaces and community spaces, um, as well as representation, um, the use of Cooper as a set for um, police scenes in movies, which um, happens quite a lot, a lot more than you expect. Um, and in addition to stopping the presence of police vehicles um, in and around campus. Um, and I think the response from the head of security has been um, pretty positive on that. Um, so so let, me, let me back up a little bit here. I've kind of jumped around somewhat, but I wanna get to um, some questions that uh, Dr. Sutton uh, had asked of, of this group here. And I think that may be what you uh, want to respond to. A number of people are writing, they want to respond to this. So um, the question is about um, uh, the, the demand for student governance, which has disappeared from students. And only, uh, she writes that only uh, students and alumni at Taubman asked for uh, inclusion in the, in the design and the curriculum making process. Um, why is that? Does it seem that students are uninterested in governing their learning apart, um, learning environments? Are they uninterested in, in, in upending power relations that exist between students and the uh, could I Could I ask this question? Because oh, yes, please. Um, I'd like to kind of uh, put it into context um, yeah. a little bit. First of all, I, I've been listening to you speak with uh, great interest because the whole and and I'm thinking about this a lot I'm a one year younger than John Lewis so I'm his generation and the person who didn't have enough courage to go out and get my head knocked in because I was practicing my French horn so I, I have been thinking a lot about what happened 50 years ago and the difference. And it's certainly apparent to me on this call, uh, the difference in the tone of conversation that's going on on this panel and what happened um, in 1968. One person made the, the uh, 
comment that you know the the administration is not being transparent or another person said the administration is not uh, moving quickly enough that there was a there was more anger in making it happen people took over buildings and made it happen and so that's what this question is about and and my analysis really happened before uh, all of the letters came in. I only analyzed 11 letters, so there may be other letters, but of the letters, it was only Taubman that said that they would like students to be included in the decision-making process. And I have three questions about that, and I wanna put a little bit of meat on it, which is why I wanted to ask the question rather than to allow uh, Sanji to ask it. So the first one is, are you interested in governing your learning environment? And by governance, I mean things like grading, which was a big issue in the 60s. Are grades done by letter, by number, or are they done by faculty actually writing to you and telling you what they think about your work and engaging in a conversation? Or is there some combination of the two? What about attendance? Attendance today, you get two absences unless you're sick or have a major life um, uh, event. Uh, is that okay with you? How about the curriculum? Someone, the person from Harvard said, we've been giving our labor to work on the curriculum. So perhaps you have been working on things like what are the required courses versus the elective courses and how many uh, credits are devoted to each. And certainly with online learning, there are going to be many governance issues that um, we haven't even had, haven't even occurred to us at this point. Now, these things come under the, the terminology for the faculty of administration or service. It's what makes the school run. And they're very time consuming. So is this some time that you're not interested in investing, that you want to spend your time someplace else? And this is not an ish, either or thing that, you know, assuming the BIPOC issues are being addressed, are you not interested in the governance of your schools? And then going a little bit deeper on that, that it appears sometimes that the faculty are in charge. The faculty are the ones that come to students with the curriculum, but the faculty are actually not in charge. The power structure is such that there are layers and layers and layers above the faculty that shape what faculty are able to do. I was president of the National Architectural Board, Accrediting Board in 1996 to 1997, and I can assure you that the degree of freedom that architecture students had at that period of time has been constrained a hundredfold since then. And there's cost in that because all of those layers of control have a price. Is that okay with you? Are you willing to accept those power relationships or is that something you want to work on? And then the next question has to do with the purpose of education. Um, John Dewey about the purpose of education, and, and actually Martin Luther King. The purpose of education is freedom, it's choice. It's making citizens, it's assuring the public good. But I got, I, I, I'm a graduate of CUNY uh, doctoral program, and I got a newsletter that had a bio from a very successful recent doctoral graduate. And, um, she gave advice to how to be successful. And she said, think about graduate school as a job. Learn not to waste time on things that are not meaningful in the job market. 
So what I'm curious, has education, because it's so expensive, become job training? And are you okay with that? The, the purpose of education is now switched from making citizens who are committed to the common good to getting a job. And you might think that these questions are facetious, but they're not facetious. I really want to know, I want to get inside your heads. I understand all the BIPOC issues, right? But I want to dig in a little bit deeper to see what context you're imagining these issues get worked out in. Because you're driving the bus and I want to be on your bus. So that's my question. Those are my three questions, actually. So, doc, Dr. Sutton, maybe I can try to just moderate here by, uh, I see some hands going up. So, Elisa, do you want to start? Her mic is off. Yeah. There you go. Hi, sorry. I wanted to say that I think, thank you for your question, Dr. Sutton. Um, I think this panel alone proves the demand for democratic student governance has not completely disappeared. Um, at least at Cooper, each individual school has their respective governances, uh, as well as student curriculum committees. So there are students actively sitting on those governances and committees. Uh, I think in terms of the history of the Cooper Union, I have a feeling that when we were free, we had uh, and fostered a more circular relationship to the institution. The institution gave to you and you gave back. And I strongly believe in this type of reciprocation. But I think with tuition, I have seen both a difference of mental and physical relationships to the schools and how that becomes different. Uh, students come in being conditioned that they're owed something uh, and that they pay something and they actually pay a huge sum and end up in a lot of student debt. Uh, with this in mind, there needs to be a shift in culture of compensating students for their work. I think Cecily mentioned this earlier. Uh, student governance and other on-campus organizations that are vital to the institutional ecosystem take an enormous amount of unpaid labor. Um, and that takes the time of potential paid labor experiences that other students could be involved in. I think Sanjana has a follow-up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And thank you, doc uh, Dr. Sutton, for the question. Um, just to follow up, there's also, I find often a culture of making classrooms unsafe. Uh, once individuals express grievances in their governances, um, ostracization uh, is always a risk, which in turn affects um, students' education qualities and the relationship to other students, faculty, uh, and the institution as a whole. Um, on the institutional level, I think there need to be protections in place uh, for students to enable them to demand change without fear of repercussion uh, and dismantling the layered power structures that you mentioned earlier uh, that create the sphere will be a part of this. Um, additionally, I just want to push back a bit on the premise that the onus of institutional change is primarily on students in the first place, um, especially if, as Elisa said, um, the work is unpaid. Um, so while students should have the space to demand these changes and they should definitely use that ability, um, an institution is more than just the sum of its students and change needs to happen at the board level, the administrative level, the faculty level, um, which demands actions from each of these groups independent of uh, student governance and student actions. So there's a few other hands that have gone up as well. Um, Hilary Morales. Hi, I can't, I can't keep myself quiet because it was an incredible question. Um, I will say that I come from two different educational systems. I come from Puerto Rico and we have, I was, it's a public institution and we are annually protest against the govern, government and we create uh, annual assemblies that we state all the issues that are happening in the institution and we unite a protest, right? It's a very democratic education. Uh, in architecture specifically, I experienced uh, architecture as, as an undergrad in Puerto Rico and also our professors allow us to engage in different classes and courses. Our curriculums were very open. So we took classes in psychology, sociology, et cetera. So my, my perspective on things is very broad. But when I moved here in the US, uh, having a grad experience, it's a very dense curriculum that there's no space for 
students to open or incorporate other approaches in design. Uh, so something that probably Natalia can talk also is that we were questioning the role of the NAB and how they structure the curriculums and the accreditation of the institutions uh, because they need to, uh, all the our institutions to fulfill the requirements for the license. Um, so how we can restructure our curriculums in a way that allows more space for students to incorporate their own approaches and design, uh, but at the same time satisfy the requirements for licensure, licensure, sorry. <laughs> Uh, probably Natalia can add to that too. Yeah, I think th that's one of the things that we've been talking. I mean, I come from Colombia. Um, I did my undergrad at Penn, so I knew a little bit more about the institution. But just the fact that here you take all these courses and yet you graduate and you don't have a license and you have to take five or six more exams in order to, to get your license. And then, but at the same time, you have to, in some states, uh, take this master's program or have a an accredited program that also has to do with this licensure, but yet it doesn't really connect. That's one thing that to me has been a little weird, but in the terms of, of your question along, it also comes along with the culture of this country. Um, I agree, like in my country, a lot of people, universities, they don't stand up for this. They have, what, they have strikes and, and they'll call out, but here from, even from, I mean, I did high school here, the indoctrination of, um, standardization of exams and, and not really being allowed to have a say in your education starting from youth. And I mean, even the, the question of, of why don't we have more uh, BIPOCs in these higher institutions is, is a lot of has to do with that. And then once you put students of color in a white institution, a lot of the times we're just grateful to be there. So to question what we're being given is also hard. So uh, I'm gonna go to Roya and then Jalene. Hi, I'm Roya. Um, I'm an MR student at UCLA, and one of our demands in our letter was also for um, students to be involved in decision making, and we especially called out um, admissions and uh, hiring a faculty and potentially um, student input on how financial aid and um, like special private scholarships are awarded um, from the school. And so for us, this comes from a huge issue with um, that's been an ongoing problem in our department reflected in so many conversations about transparency as a whole. Um, and that's been reflected. I even had a conversation with a faculty member a few weeks ago who told me uh, verbatim, nobody knows who's in charge in the department. And so um, that makes it really difficult for us to feel like we can make any progress because it's very difficult to tell um, who is supposed to be held accountable in these situations. And so for us having more student input in decision making um, can be an effective way to make sure that people just know what's going on and, and you know, these power structures that leave people out can be slowly dismantled. Um, that way, knowledge is power. So I'm sure that um, Erica and my classmates can also follow up on that. Um, let, let me go to J Jeline first, though she's sorry. I'll, we'll come right back to you, Erica. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sutton, for the question. Um, I'm Jeline. I'm at Harvard GSD with Cecily. Um, sorry to butt in here, and also Erica can go ahead if it flows a little better. Um, I don't mind, <laughs> but I guess to push well not to push back but I guess it's like a very layered question it's a deep like there's so many different layers to the question and so I guess one part of it is specific to Harvard is we have the Black and Design Conference that was 100% student initiated student run I am the current president of um, the African American Student Union Cecil is in Africa GSD leadership and as well as ASU and so I think the question for us too was not that it was a student question, like we have been very committed to showing the administration the changes and this past fall was the third conference of uh, black and design. And so it was a deeper question of the institutional changes that a lot of people have talked about and like these longer term like structural problems that we weren't seeing being done. We were showing them creative ideas of how to include more black speakers, 
we were showing them repeatedly bringing and uplifting voices of people, professional black scholars, you know, bringing into the GSD. So I think it was a little bit of pushing back on like, okay, their excuses is that it takes too long, there's labor involved. It's, and I think the GSD was getting too comfortable with putting that labor and example of student work. And so I think for us, it was about separating that difference and really saying, no, this is what students are doing. And most of us are here at the GSD, maybe two years on average, architecture students are there longer. Um, but I think too, having a real honest conversation about what is the work of the institution and what are their clear long-term plans. They made some short-term um, changes. And like you mentioned, like because our school semester will be on fall this semester, we also made it a point that you're already redoing a lot of these curriculum changes. And so there have been hiring of new faculty, there have been more intentionality placed there, but we're, we still see that as the easy fruit, right? Someone put in the chat, like the lower hanging fruit is to bring more black and brown bodies into a primarily white institution. So we're still pushing for these like longer, more structural changes to be made. Um, but yeah, I think I just wanted to put that point in and there's so many more thoughts and like pieces and layers to that um, question that you posed. Jillian, let's go back to Erica for, for her response. Hi, um, I'm Erica, also from UCLA. Um, in addition to our uh, administrative uh, hiring and uh, inclusion, we also wanted to do, um, we, in our letter, we said reevaluate the curriculum and restructure coursework to have students be um, participants in the decolonization of the core curriculum. And um, we've been uh, backed with, uh, or faced with um, much uh, pushback in um, when we wanna talk about contemporary architects or um, black architects or LGBTQIA architects, that there's um, separate areas where we can talk about that outside of the classroom, but not in the classroom, um, which we took a uh, huge offense to. And um, we haven't had an EDI um, committee until I believe it was just this month. Please correct me if I'm wrong, other UCLA. Um, and with uh, students can participate in the fall to be on these subcommittees. Um, and we asked if it would be compensated and uh, it said it would not be. Uh, we are a public school, but again, and um, with our chair, she responded, if you think this is unpaid labor, then you don't have to participate. Um, and we are, um, Yes, and we also, uh, similar to this, we, we've made a suggestion to have accountability um, for the department on, because they had a draft uh, in response to our letter that we had a meeting about that was very, there were a bunch of inconsistencies um, in there and contradictions, and there wasn't an accountability matrix or anything um, in regards to that. And we asked if maybe we could talk about it now, how we can hold you accountable, if we can see, uh, hear what you are talking about in the EDI meetings. And um, we were uh, presented with they don't take meeting minutes in those meetings. And we were wondering how other schools approach these issues with accountability. And uh, because now it seems like we're starting from scratch um, at UCLA and uh, we want to make change without wasting our time describing what is wrong when they aren't seeing what's wrong. Um, thank you. Let's see, maybe we can go to Lexi. Yeah, I thank you so much, um, Dr. Sutton, for your questions. And I think that, um, I think that personally, I mean, I know all of us have our own Zoom meetings and groups and everything, but I think we are angry. Um, I think that there is, um, and maybe the Zoom format isn't conducive to all of us having individual conversations and um, having that kind of energy, but 
I think that just to speak to your question about like the responsibility of the students and responsibility of us, I think that that we have really tried in our, our group of alumni and Ian speak up whenever, um, just to kind of draw the boundary of what we think the institution um, is responsible for, but then also to kind of, we've come to kind of understand, I think some of its limits. And I think that the, the way that we are, you know, battling institutional racism is that it's so embedded within the institution that it, it's almost impossible to extract out of that the whiteness that is just a part of every single kind of interaction. So I think that a lot of us who have kind of wrote these letters with incredible like energy and enthusiasm and have kind of found ourselves slowly doing more administration for the administration. And I think that in that way, it feels kind of exploitative. And I think that for that reason, a lot of us have probably gone off in different directions and found ways to, you know, really capitalize on, I think what was, a, a general kind of in, in um, atmosphere in 1968 that allowed more people to speak out and protest more effectively. Like the idea that like black power movements had their own CDCs and they actually had this idea that, you know, um, you know, black power is also in the environment. It's how you kind of engage in your community and learning more about Yale. There was a black workshop in 1968, you know, which required or Man, um, demanded for 50% like black enrollment at one point and ended up getting kind of dissolved. So I think that the, that knowing that this moment existed and knowing that it, it kind of was quieted makes me feel like going outside of the institution and trying to, I mean, I'm the great thing about being on this call is that I've been on a Zoom call with like a couple people and we've been working on this thing called Dark Matter University, which is a completely satellite um, thing. Um, Al and Taya um, and I, all of you guys should become a part of it because um, I think that knowing how um, you know the school and the institution is really related to to licensure and to um, NCARB and NAB and all of these larger institutional things that go beyond our individual institutions and are have their own problems I think makes it we you kind of have to you're right to say that it is our responsibility in some ways to to like say that we can determine the future of our school but i think that really thinking about the channels that are most effective is kind of like the next step yeah. i think so, what, oh, go ahead to, Ian. to build on what lexi was saying um in terms of what work we expect the school to do and what work that we are willing to take on ourselves i think part of it for some universities um I've been working with Yale and I've been working with Shane at UF now a little bit. Um, there's lack of an awareness and acknowledgement still from lots of the administration. And if, you know, if they're not willing to do the work, that means they still don't understand there's a problem. So I think getting them to really accept that and own that and acknowledge the problem um, is still the first step and still what some of us are fighting for. Um, I think some schools, the deans have come out with great response letters and great initiatives. Um, other schools are still far behind um, and still working on educating the administration that they need to do more. Um, the bar is set too low and some of them are being kind of complacent. Um, so I think that's like another tactic that we still need to be using. So, you know, DMU, kind of the satellite operation that's happening to come and inform the university, but I think the university, the people there still need to be educated and we still need to email them and still need to have calls with them um, and continue just voicing kind of our opinions uh, to keep it moving. All right, thank you, Ian. Um, Dr. Sun, do you wanna add anything before, I'm gonna keep going through these, these hands that are raised. Um, do you wanna add a, a comment while we're moving through these? Only to say I'm really fascinated by the responses and by comments like indoctrination, um, exploitative. Uh, I, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I, I gave a, a little talk at Pratt, I think a couple of years ago, in which I said, I think the whole system is broken. It can't be fixed. And, and this discussion is telling me that there's a, there's a disease going on here. And it's, it's connected 
to the racism issue. But it's almost bigger than that. Um, so I, I'm listening and I'm writing down and I'm going to listen to the tape because I'm here to learn. So, so um, my mission is to get through as many of the participants to hear them talk. So will you just interrupt me? Um, if you can use the hand button or flag me down, I will stop and, and have, let you take the floor. So I'm going to go to Aisha Shine. Hi, it's Asia. Um, I'm a part of Taubman. I just gradu graduated from their master's program. And I also helped with uh, Knowlton School of Architecture's letter. I went there for undergrad. And so to dig a little bit deeper into some of the questions around student governance and um, sort of some of those other things, I know, for example, at Michigan, we have Prop 2, which is sort of this law proposal that came into effect that basically tried to work, in my opinion, like against sort of the early like affirmative action items that were put into place. Um, and so I know like Emily and Serena, um, a lot of the folks in the DGA, they have done a lot of work to like educate people on sort of this rule. And so I think that that's just like an additional barrier to sort of like the organization <clears throat> efforts. Um, so that's just like another thing that students have to learn in order for us to effectively communicate what it is that we want. Whereas like at OSU, for example, they're land grant. And so they don't necessarily have those same restrictions, but yet we still have other restrictions that we're trying to learn. So I think just trying to be strategic about the things we, we are demanding and like, can that actually be accomplished might be slowing down some of those things as well. Great. Can I Thank piggyback you. off of Asia a little bit? Um, I also went to Ohio State for undergrad and I'm going to University of Michigan for my um, ARC. Um, so we have very similar experiences being black females in these two predominantly white institutions. Um, and I really appreciate Dr. Sutton's um, questions, um, all the work she's done, and your history at University of Michigan as well, um, which everyone may not know. Um, so I think you maybe can understand, and a lot of people on here can understand, that we are angry and we put on, put in a lot of work, unpaid work, exploitive work, administrative work, um, and at the core of it, we're architects, and yet most of us are architects or planning to be, and yet we have learned skills in a numerous amount of areas that we are not necessarily qualified for, but now I feel as though I could definitely, definitely get a job in any of these positions. Um, but I want to say also to you know, you specifically, Dr. Sun, you specifically uh, called out Taubman in this um, in this initiative, and we actually got from one of our um, assistant deans the um, initiative to say that we as students are indeed not only like we can ask to be a part of this this um, movement, but also we are at a public institution. We are we have that right to be, um, to have a say in our education, essentially. Um, and so me and Asia did a lot of work. Um, I am the co-president of our NOMAS chapter at University of Michigan. I was the co-president of the NOMAS chapter at uh, Ohio State. And we've done a lot of work to try to spread the word of needing more BIPOC voices in the architecture field. and. I'm gonna be honest here and say that I feel in partnering with Emily, my colleague who clearly is a, a white female, that I was taken more seriously with her than I was with my other um, black colleagues. Um, and I think that's something that maybe we haven't talked about yet that um, the administration has a system of white supremacy and they take they take things seriously that they understand. Um, so I think that's how we have to get in. And again, talking about my chief diversity officer, Shawana Dos Santos, she's been super integral to my education 
um, maybe more than some of my faculty, um, that it's important to get in and open the door for others behind you. And that's why I think I'm doing this work um, and kind of to what DJ said earlier, like, no, it's not a responsibility to, to educate others, but um, that's something the black community has and will always do, I believe. Um, and it's tiring and it deserves to be paid, definitely. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to add those two cents in there. Ser Serena, I think, you know, you, you said some things that really set off a lot of comments in the chat room and are really important. And I'm, I'm sorry, we just have so many people and I want to make sure that we're all getting a chance to talk. But I think this idea of um, being taken seriously is a whole nother, you know, conversation point um, that, that I think a, a lot of people I see are wanting to talk about that. But I, I want to throw to um, AL to, uh, to sort of continue. A.L. Hugh? A.L. Who? Sorry, it took me a second to unmute myself. Okay. Um, so I'm A.L. I graduated from Columbia GSAP in 2017, so I'm not a current student, and it's really great to hear from current students because I feel like I've totally lost that connection, but I just want to say that I feel for current students, I empathize, and I'm like, I'm so impressed by all the work that you all are already doing. Um, and I hear you about doing all this like unpaid labor and um, trying to be heard and trying to make changes, but getting shut down. Um, when I graduated in 2017, I had been in grad school for three years, so from 2014 to 2017. And in addition to um, going to studio and all that, I was also like an activist, always writing open letters and always like getting shut down by the administration. So I know where where you guys are coming from, um, and. Um, I, I was also part of the, I was on the official like program council, which is kind of like a student government, but without any real power. Um, we had one meeting a semester with the dean um, who listened to us, but often didn't take action or commit to taking action. And I could see like firsthand how slow and lethargic the pace of the administration could be. Um, but I was also a union organizer with the Graduate Workers of Columbia, and we were back then and they still are fighting for higher wages for graduate workers, more transparency in job appointments and job responsibilities and funding and housing stipends. And the way that we built power was by organizing across departments. So we were working not only within the architecture department, but also outside of the architecture department all throughout Columbia University. And we all realized that we were in the same economic situations and then by organizing direct actions. And I wanna bring it back to Sharon's point of like being angry and connecting that to direct action because I, th I think in 1968 like that was after a bunch of direct actions had happened at Columbia where like buildings were occupied and like that scared the administration right that got them to act like they, that got them to finally sit down and listen to students and finally take their needs into account so maybe the next step is banding together across schools and saying like we as students have power and we want these changes and we want them now and that and organizing some kind of direct action that disrupts studio and disrupts like business as usual and disrupts what makes you feel powerless what makes you feel exploited um and i say that as someone who tried to get the architecture to school to do that when i was in grad school um and i just want to say that the time right now feels totally different and i totally understand the powerlessness, the exploitation, but the, the time right now feels a lot different. And I feel like we, you, not we, I'm not a student anymore. You all have so much more leverage right now. Um, and I just wanna end with, as an alum, I wanna stress that, um, I don't speak for all alums, but I, as an alum, I wanna say that I, we have your back. Like we were in your shoes, um, we were at your studio desks, we were feeling the same feelings as you and we see your struggle and want you to succeed. Um, so, yeah. That's All right, thank you. That, you know, I think that's, um, that's good to hear. And we saw so many names uh, and that, you know, the, the signatures keep, keep piling up on, on a lot of letters. Um, let's go to Alice, Alice Chai. Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Sutton for asking those questions. And it's uh, so great to see all these panelists and their responses. 
Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Rice University uh, from all of the alumni at Rice and uh, also sort of trying to be a voice to some of the students who are currently at Rice. Um, and, you know, Rice in, Rice in Houston, Texas, also just um, a heads up, I actually saw our Dean's name in the, um, in the participants. So I know that um, John Kasparian, you are the interim Dean at Rice currently and you are listening to us now. Um, and I'm grateful to see that you're here. Uh, so the letter that we wrote to you, John, and to also um, the other uh, professors at Rice, um, we wanted to speak uh, on behalf of the current students. And we've been doing a lot of uh, organization. Um, there hasn't been a black faculty member at Rice in 30 years, and there currently is no black faculty member at Rice. Um, and I think that seeing this lack of representation uh, in faculty, actually there, there are no, um, I think there might be only one POC faculty member currently. Um, at Rice. And I think that not seeing these role models ahead of you, as we've been talking to the current students, which is what we're finding, uh, the current students are finding it difficult to see themselves in positions um, after school. And without this role model, they don't see any potential or haven't had a role model who can directly communicate that this, um, this trajectory is possible, and that there are people who are willing to help them and to bring them into positions as they leave school. And I think, um, I think that we, um, not only, of course, as um, as a group are trying to amplify the, the objectives of the Black Lives Matter movement, but we also want to amplify the few black voices that are in our university. There's only one black student every three years or so at Rice. And so when we see this collective uh, speaking now, we're trying to self-organize and it's such a small school, there's only 20, you know, about 25 students a year. Um, there, there is a lot of insecurity about whether or not the students should be at the table. You know, because when you're one face of color, um, in many years of whiteness, how do you have a seat at that table? You know, what does it even look like or what does it look like after you leave that table? And I think that we, um, as alumni, are in a very unique position where we don't have the pressure of the university looking at us as one out of 25, um, but instead as sort of a medium to facilitate and negotiate on their behalf. So I think um, we as alumni are trying to write these letters uh, to amplify their letters that they're also writing and to also create independent networks that are independent of these school systems for mentorship. And I think that um, this is really the agenda of our alumni and it is work. And it is something that we are recognizing now and we, we are really asking the university, uh, John, we are asking you in particular as interim dean to seek this out in a new deanship, um, in, the appoint sorry, in the appointment of a new dean. And we are asking to be, um, to be included in, in some of this consideration. Thank you. Do you think a, a forum like this helps um, make that point across because you can see the solidarity and the number of students and participants in this uh, in this call alone? Yeah, I think it's super interesting to see uh, this panel of faces. It's really encouraging. Um, but also independently, um, we are a small student body, but we are a really strong alumni uh, network. And between us, we've been doing a lot of work that is not visible yet in connecting to the years above and the years below and creating networks where people want to be reached and contacted, who want to donate, who want to get involved. And I think that um, it's really encouraging to see all these other universities doing the same. Great, thanks. All right, let's go to Taylor Latimer. Hi, um, my name is Taylor Latimer and I'm the NOMAS president at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm going into my fifth year of the BR program. Um, so I, I wanted to first just say, um, I don't want to speak for every organization, but at least for um, the Carnegie Mellon organization, when we um, submitted our action items, the, in terms of just referencing um, one school's mention of um, requesting that students be um, added or included in these conversations and it not being on other lists, um, that our list at least was deemed as something that was not a finalized list by any means. And um, we actually started or we stated to them that this list is not finished and there's more to be done. And at any point we could add on to this list. Um, so if it's not seen on the list, it's not something that we don't care about, but it's definitely something, um, it's definitely been something that's been in conversation. So we are definitely interested in being a part of the conversation. But there's also an immense fear, um, I think, from students. We, there's so much pressure to succeed and um, to graduate. And like someone else said, we are often just grateful to be in the space. 
So um, within our call to action specifically, we created a committee to bring students into the conversation and the design making process. Um, and we were able to actually take our action items and split them into four categories and once uh, dedicated specifically to administ administration. And in interestingly enough, um, within each of these committees, the students outweigh the professors. We've had a lot more participation from the students than the faculty at the school. And so right now we're trying to actually pull in the faculty to get them to participate because the students, we know that there's an issue, but the faculty, they, some of them are still not getting it. So I think um, part, of, part of what needs to be worked on is bringing that faculty in and um, making sure that they're, they're hearing our conversations, um, that they are listening and participating um, so it's not just the students in these conversations with the few professors um, that do get it. I think that's, you know, you also touched on some important things here because the graduation rates are often the metrics for a lot of these accrediting agencies and, and um, that, that can be conversely a problem for students that need help and, and student that students that need support. Um, let's go to Allison. Allison Conley. Hi. I'm Allison and I'm an, I graduated from Columbia GSAT in 2013. And speaking to your point about students that need support, and one of the things that we've seen is that as a profession, architecture is still rooted in this apprenticeship system that the separates the theoretical <clears throat> education from the training and craft and hard skills of the profession. And in this way, it's like not only do we have to bear the burden of the high cost of education, we also have to then bear the burden of subsidizing the profession with our labor. The first uh, job offer that I ever received after graduating was for $20,000 a year without benefits in New York City, in Manhattan. And that is something that, you know, I thankfully didn't have to take that position, but that's something that somebody else took that job. And it takes so much economic privilege to, for that to be possible. And, you know, even if you're making double that as a graduate, it is still a huge economic burden if you are trying to pay to student debt, support yourself, and potentially support other members of your family. So I think that, you know, a lot of what we're talking about in these alumni conversations and student conversations is bridging this enormous gap between the, like, highly theoretical and ambitious visionary architectural education and the realities of a quotidian architecture um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for everybody that is in this room and like the coming together of, you know, recent alumni and current students that we're trying to recenter this conversation on what matters to us and what we think the profession needs now. I, I think that's really well said. So I'm going to read another quote here from someone uh, you all recognize here. But um, if you want more people of color in architecture, you need to change the mission need to focus the mission on creating the everyday fabric of the environment. And if you look at it that way, you would not need eight years to get your degree and another three to get your license. If you looked at it as architecture as preparing people to do a variety of things, not just hero buildings, but the buildings that support people's lives, that form the fabric of the city, you would have a very different feel that would look more like nursing than architecture. And that's Dr. Sutton I'm, I'm quoting from. And I think that that's a really important thought here because, um, you know, that, that's something that's uh, central to the mission at City Tech uh, as well. Um, so, you know, we, we are trying to do exactly that, a ground up program and expanding the reach of all these uh, students of color and what they can do. So we haven't heard from a, a few other people. I think that uh, Aldo, uh, if you're here, um, I want to give you a chance to speak. Aldo, are you there? Uh, all right, I'll go. David Hecht. Hey there. Hello, I'm David. Um, I'm a graduate of the GSAP MR program in oh, 2014, and I did the research, research fellowship in 2015. Um, I was also, along with AL, uh, at a different time, a member of the program council. So I had a lot of interface with the administration as we fought for some of these same issues that everyone is bringing up 
and before I go on, I just want to raise up the voices that and, and the, the effort and labor that everyone has been putting in and really uh, give a note of appreciation. I'm, uh, you know, white presenting male in, 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 in from New York that uh, has a lot of, you know, latent privilege that I've been experiencing. So I'm part of the effort to amplify what everyone else is saying. Um, and just trying to see how we can be supportive and active in advancing what uh, is, is something where uh, someone like me only experiences from the outside and, and perhaps in, in a state of unawareness. But um, in trying to become aware of that, um, especially through the work that people like the Black faculty at GSAP and the Black Students Alliance have done, um, I would first highly, highly recommend everyone take a look at those two, the Unlearning Whiteness Letter and On the Futility of Listening. It's, it's two of the, uh, the, the amazing efforts that um, Black and Indigenous people of color have been doing in, in this realm. So the first thing we're trying to do in the GSAP group is amplify that work. Um, and in, in that, I, I think uh, one of the, the quote that, um, that Sanjeev had read was um, from Dr. Sutton was a really key thing that we have been frustrated by in our efforts uh, in working with the administration. We were part of a call uh, that a number of alumni were on with the Dean. Uh, and our main question had been, uh, what is our institution GSAP actually going to do? And we were met with nothing approaching an answer. Um, and the, the demands that the faculty and students have raised, uh, including things like engaging with the local communities and really rethinking the shape of what design education is and orienting around the actual demands of, of communities for what design professionals can do have just slid completely off um, of curricula and of efforts to hire faculty that are engaged with these communities from these communities um, to support research in these communities or from faculty who are actively engaged and representing these things. So there's a lot of frustration in terms of what we've been trying to get answers on and uh, what the what the alum what the faculty or sorry the administration is actually showing a willingness to do um, so I think some of the pressures that we're hoping to leverage are on terms of um, showing these like the different administrations that alumni are not supporting the lack of action but are instead demanding accountability and demanding responses to the to the, the, the words that, and, and demands and actions that are coming from the communities have been most affected. Um, but yeah, I'm actually very curious, uh, or at least one of the things I'm hearing is that there's a lack of recognition and, and uh, almost an, and, and the exploitation that's happening. Um, so I'm, I'm really wondering how uh, those groups that have been starting to get a foothold have found, like what are the levers that they're, that they're able to actually engage and if maybe that's coming from students, maybe that's coming from faculty, maybe it demands organized labor action. Um, some of the work that we've encountered is, you know, labor power can be withheld. And I'm curious if, if people are talking about organizing collectively as students or as faculty uh, to withhold that labor in the form of strikes. So I think that is exactly the point where we want to talk about the next steps. And that's, that's, um, the schedule is to, to ask participants about that. Um, how do we continue the effort in, a, in an effective and progressive manner, not dying out like many great efforts or movements that come about in a time of media covered crises? So um, that's also a question that was submitted by uh, one of the participants. So I will throw that to the panelists. What happens next? Um, so we haven't heard from a few people, prepared or not, I'm going to call on you. Um, Zarina? Is Zarina here? All right, we don't have Zarina or she doesn't have the unmute button. Um, Miranda Rincon, did we already hear from you? Tiffany Orozco. I can chime in for them. I think they're having internet issues. 
uh, in terms of like some next steps that we've been talking about at UCLA or like some student orgs, uh, because I think students in the past have had um, had been doing this sort of work or attempting to do this sort of work, but it essentially falls, you know, to the next generation and nothing is continued on. Uh, and also some other things that I kind of wanted to mention about where we were with the UCLA is like, we're not even at the point I feel of um, recognizing past harms. And really the only time that that came up was when the international students um, were going to be not allowed back into the States. And so it seemed to be like a, fi a financial um, incentive for the school to address um, that issue along with, you know, what has come up with the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so it seems like for me, maybe some of the only ways to get things, you know, recognized or get things moving along has, is, has a financial concern to it. And I don't know if like an action step could be to, you know, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what that would be outside of just uh, not giving our money to these institutions. Um, but anyhow, that's uh, kind of where we're at right now in terms of trying to continue on with that work is uh, start an org. We don't even have a NOMAS at our school to get that going as well and to um, being able to have this sort of work continue on in the future. Thanks. All right, thanks, Jordan. Um, Mia Nguyen? Hi there. Um, I'll keep my response brief because I would like to yield my time for any BIPOC folks who would like to speak. Um, but I, I will say that at UVA, we have, oh, I'm, I'm Mian. I am a contributor on the call to action from UVA. Um, and I was NOMAS president in 2018 at UVA. Um, <clears throat> I think that what's important right now is being strategic about how we leverage um, the support that we have amassed. So at UVA, we are working with the um, foundation, uh, sorry, the Dean's Advisory Board and the Young Alumni Council to try to talk to continue this conversation and these dialogues. We did get a response from the administration and our Committee um, of Inclusion and Equity, um, but there are some loop, there are some um, absences of like process for assessing curriculum, for example, that we would like to see fleshed out. So um, I think that there are, there are a lot of different things that we can do individually at our institutions, which would be to like assess certain barriers and resources, um, and then reading how these barriers are being presented to us um, and whether or not they're true. Um, and then I think the second thing that we should do um, is get together um, and um, kind of build a network within our contributors to these letters, um, but also to the folks who have signed in support. Um, if there are folks who, you know, if they have their kids at home, if they can't really be as active, I think there are other ways that we can leverage just even their signature or their ideas or what other what other things they can do at their institutions, um, their firms, their organizations. Um, I think that this is a real moment for us to understand our responsibility as members of a society and um, that all folks um, should leverage whatever power they have moving forward. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I want to go to uh, Jalissa Mills. Hi, um, my name is Jalissa Mills. I graduated from the University of Florida uh, last year. Um, right now, moving forward, we had very positive feedback from our dean, which was surprising and really amazing. But there have been huge gaps with the next steps they've put a lot of work on, onto us and there has been some pushback from us with that just because we do see that yes, we are helping them in moving steps forward, but this also has to be a collaborative effort between both of us and us being mostly alumni and a lot of um, undergrad students. We don't feel, some of the undergrad students might not feel comfortable actually talking one-on-one -on -one with, with teachers or professors or faculty for that matter and creating a safe space in the environment that is studio and that is us just walking around the halls of, of the actual institution needs to be addressed. There's certain things that our um, director Bosworth has wanted us to do and definitely wants to implement and creating like unbiased training for faculty and students is something that we're trying to implement before school actually starts so that there can be something put in place for everyone to learn and to be more accountable for their actions. Coming, going to the University of Florida was very eye-opening. I did, I lived in New York and grew up there and then I went to the University of Florida for my undergrad and being in the South was different. 
that's all I have to say. <laughs> but um, it's a place where I saw myself growing as a student and I want, and we all wanted it to be better. That's why we're writing these letters. And creating the alumni network, I think, will create something that may, will create a space that maybe students might not be able to actually be one-on-one -on -one with their teach with their professors. Because coming from an alumni, not that we don't have any ties with the community, but we have a little less one-on-one -on -one with the professors every day. And if there's any like hit back from the professors from what we're actually saying, that it'll just come back to the alumni at the end of the day. Great, thank you. You know, I, I noticed that a, a majority of the um, panelists here are graduate students. Um, are you, did you graduate with a uh, master's from U of Florida? No, I graduated with my undergraduate degree. Good, then it's really, it is excellent to see here. It's re that's relevant for my, <laughs> my cause for sure. Okay. Um, Rachel, Sean, I don't know if we, I might have cut you off earlier. Rachel, do you want to add to that? Also, U of F. Yeah, I did. Um, hi, I'm Rachel. I did undergrad at UF and I'm going into the master's program. I'm going to my last year. Um, I think Shane and Jalisa summed it up pretty well. Um, just seeing everyone talk and spread such great ideas kind of made me realize that UF is kind of behind, which is makes me sad to say, but um, right now there is a large gap in terms of what the faculty understands what we want versus what we actually want. And so they're taking a lot of the things that we're asking for, and it might just be ignorance, but it's a lot of misinterpretation, which is a problem. And so um, right now there's no foundation for inclusivity and diversity, which is kind of the main initiative right now for us. So um, yeah, I think right now we're just working on spreading accountability and making sure that everyone knows what we're doing and being clear and transparent on what the tasks are and what they actually mean versus what um, the faculty thinks that they mean. Great, thank you. Um, Cami Beckford. Hi, I'm Cami and I'm an undergrad at University of Pittsburgh. And I feel like Pitt is in a different position because we're not a school, we're housed within history of architecture, history of art and architecture department. So moving forward, because we're really relying on other departments like urban studies and like museum studies, uh, intra organizing and like interdepartment education that the curriculum isn't doing yet to get everyone on the same page of why we're so angry so that everyone can come together. And as a collective, we have to go to the entire school that houses us all. And also um, mentorship because Carissa and I, that were the co-creators of our letter are in our last year so teaching the lower years how this work is done because we're learning as we go too so teaching how this work is done to them so when we leave we've created a sustainable framework and that they can keep moving forward with that and i know harissa has something to add as well yes hi everyone i'm harissa i'm going into my final year in the architecture program at pitt um so yeah cami basically said pitt has a very different scenario than a lot of other universities because we are housed within a department. Um, so a lot of the obstacles that the department even faces itself when um, wanting to make changes has to go through a ton of bureaucracy. So we're with them on that. And um, one of the first steps that we're working on currently with our administration is creating a committee of students. And like Cami said, we do want younger students to be part of this, but we also want students outside of the architecture um, department to be part of this as well because a lot of different fields of studies relate um, to these issues and have similar problems as well. So in order to keep it sustainable, um, we're looking to keep different ages, um, different fields of studies, as well as graduate students um, to be part of this as well. And then another step I think that might become a problem for us is finding funding in order to keep this sustainable is funding, um, especially for us, like a department like us, we don't receive a lot of that, so. Great, thank you. Let, let me go to the hand set array, the handful went up. Uh, Ian? 
Yeah, so I just want to talk about the next step for the group at YSOA that Lexi and I are a part of. We started with kind of eight letter writers, um, and we've stayed strong up until this point, and we're kind of now starting to branch out and help support other networks that are working towards inclusivity. So um, kind of two of our letter writers are now working with Yale Nomos to set up a mentorship program between alumni and current students. Um, Lexi has gone on to help out DMU. Um, I've kind of shifted my focus a little bit away from Yale and have now started help out my undergrad UF with Shane and Jaleesa and Anne um, and Rachel. Um, one of our members started Counter Canon on Instagram. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that. Um, that's been really great. But I think it's, it's good now that we got, we did get some momentum with our school. And so now we have more free time to help out other networks working towards the same thing and kind of spreading our knowledge and experience, I think has been helpful. Um, but we haven't given up on keeping pressure on Yale yet. Um, I think it's gonna be a continual kind of pressure that's been needed, that's going to be needed for a couple of years. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be the eight of us for the next couple of years, but um, we're gonna make sure that it's gonna to continue to happen. Great, thanks. Let's go to Shane. Hi again. Um, something to add as well uh, from our feedback from uh, faculty and also local architects in Gainesville was um, we did receive positive feedback, but pushed back in a way that we were being tone policed, uh, if that's the term, to tone policing, in a way that we were, people thought they were being yelled at, which is true, uh, which is a true sentiment of how we felt as BIPOC. And that's a question that has to be asked to them as an that's how we felt and um, in a way it's not really right to to police students that have uh, faced racism and discrimination and uh, really want to implement a change within the institutions. Thank you. Yeah, I think if, I, if I could just jump in there, I think that it's really, it's that's always a, an issue to kind of deal with the professors that you you know and you also are like they're a lot of them are defensive to a certain degree and for understandably but i think that remembering always that this is like a much broader thing that we're all kind of a part of and dealing with and it's it's hard for institutions sometimes to to realize that they're not being no individuals being singled out but i think even as nicholas introduced himself as going to yale which was like male pale and yale and like battling that as like a paradigm is just like it's so much bigger than any single individual. And I think that to all the faculty and you know professors that are also attending the call, I think it's good to remind them that too. So. Great, DJ, you wanna add to that? Um, I actually wanna uh, touch base back to the next steps. Um, in response, I, I kinda wanna put something in perspective and uh, also, before doing that, I wanted to identify that, you know, while I'm a part of the MR program at Syracuse, um, I'm an HBCU alum, um, Tennessee State University in Nashville. Um, I heard that, you know, there was some kind of discrepancy about reaching out to uh, certain HBCUs, um, and I have various contacts, so I would love to be a part of, you know, just reconnecting those going forward. But relative to moving forward and putting this um, con concept in perspective, something that I've realized being a part of uh, the, the, the architecture environment educationally now, my perspective and thought is that the, the university, the modern day university now um, is in a place to where the factory was 70, 80 years ago. And now we see the university acting as, you know, a modern day factory and the employees are the students in a sense, you know, we're working 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week, not going to sleep, not, you know, not getting the, the proper, you know, the health that our minds and bodies need to continue to sustain the workload. You know, so if we put that understanding into the concept, uh, into the concept of how the factory became the corporation, you know, and how that change began to change over time and we saw factories lessen and people transition to the corporation. What kind of autonomy do we allow the younger generation, the first year students to understand that, okay, you have a level of autonomy that you need to first become aware of 
relative to what you're being taught. You know, and for us as, you know, future alumni, you know, architects who care about this profession, how do we continue to, you know, empower them to let them know that the change is happening now. The, 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 the epoch of where curriculum is now is changing and it starts with the incoming first year students. And the relationship in which we see this capitalistic society that America constantly and constantly allows to evolve is in that evolution stage right now. So if we can capture them, I see kind of on down the line, maybe in the next five to 10 years, we kind of see the change that we want to see happening in the next generation. I think, you know, that, that's very well put. I, I see a lot of people are writing about what you're saying right now. So let, let's go to Taylor. Um, yeah, so um, one of the things I think is that is really important um, is getting a statement of commit, like a public state of commitment from the schools um, that is published on their websites, like brochures, anything that it is that they're showing um, that's talking about the things that they're doing. We need those public statements of commitment um, saying that they're going to do the things that we've asked and requested. Um, and then an outline of what is considered successful for each of these action items um, is something that's gonna be really important as well. And um, a, a timeline that goes with each of these action items. Um, knowing what is short-term, long-term, um, anything that falls somewhere in between. We need to know and have someone that and not just one person, because we can't put this all on one person, but um, a committee that is set to um, keep their eye on this list and make sure that um, people are continuing to do the work. And so if we even put, start to track the hard facts of courses and things like that, that we're putting into, into action, um, that might make it even better to to see that these things are actually happening as we as we move forward. Great, thank you for that, Taylor. Let, let's go to Emily Ibersol. Yeah, uh, thank you. And Taylor, yeah, that's huge. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about next steps for what Talbin has been working on. So um, we are currently assigning each one of our action items to a working group. And basically are soliciting college-wide involvement within these working groups. So in the working groups themselves, they have, there's faculty, there's alumni, some have third-party reviewers, um, and then of course students. Um, and heading each one of these working groups behind the actions is um, a, a committee member who worked on the design justice action. So this is really our way of holding accountability and, and being active in, in this fight. Um, but yeah, no, I, and to Cami and Harissa's point about building a sustainable framework, I'm, and I'm really curious to hear other ideas on how we can um, create a system that can live on beyond our years. Um, because, you know, especially because this, this doesn't end in a letter or um, an Instagram post or um, a, a marketing opportunity. This is, this is really a process and, and we need to all step into this process and help alleviate some of the load. Um, from our BIPOC colleagues. So um, yeah, that's kind of what I want to say more. Got it, thanks. I, I, you know, I, I like that point a lot um, because I think social media has co-opted and created symbols that have just um, diluted um, some of the major points that, that we need to be talking about. Um, Alice, do you wanna um, jump in there? Yeah, sure. Uh, to DJ's point, I think um, a lot of the alumni at Rice have been talking about how we as people who have been working, uh, as alumni who have been working in these professions can, can change the profession from the inside. You know, without the pressure of the school on us, like how can we be hiring people? How can we be starting our own firms to change it so the profession is not exploiting students as they're coming out of school? We're not setting this precedent that then like you know, crushes the expectations of students as they graduate and then forces them into these inter unpaid internships or low paid internships. You know, we, we've all done it as we left school. And I think the question is like, how can we keep this momentum as alumni, as current students um, past 
you know, past just our schools and beyond, um, beyond to, to continue this into the profession because the profession really needs to change. Thank you. Uh, Natalia? Yeah, something that for us for Next Steps that we've been, and we even highlighted in our letter, is about making these efforts a priority. I mean, a lot of people have, have come out and say, like, yeah, we're doing this, but then they don't dedicate space, time, or power to some of the committees that are, at least for our institution, we have a lot of committees that are forming, but they're, and the ones that have been there before, recommendation committees, and I've been part of it for a year now, um, and very little has happened from it, and it's mainly because even just just as us students are exhausted, our faculty members are also exhausted, and they're putting in the time to, to make these um, committee meetings once a month for an hour, but then how much can you really do if all you're doing is once a month for an hour, you're passing on uh, recommendations to the dean. So a lot of things that we're asking for as a beginning step is just to have a way to make this a, this a priority in, in faculty, in students as well, to be a space and, and time effort that we can put together and and start working for it because otherwise it's I mean it's kind of how uh, mass distraction happens like right now yes we're all focused on this but then life is going to come back and we're going to be distracted again and unless we start to make this an actual um, principle of focus we're not going to we're just going to lose momentum so that's for us um, at Penn that's our first main focus right now is being able to bring this forth as a focus that's not going to get lost. I, I think those are all Look, I'm, this conversation is, is too important and too loaded, and each one probably deserves its own forum and, and discussion points. Um, but I, I want to, um, I'm going to, there are a few more questions, but I'd like to throw back to um, Dr. Sutton to give her some time to, um, to, to talk about what she's been listening to and what she's hearing. So this has been a fantastic um, discussion. There's a lot of power here. And I think the aim should be, the next step should be, how do you organize it? How do you put some juice behind it? As DJ said, the university has become a corporation. And just like the rest of society in which the top people in the corporation are have all the power and then the people who are earning the bucks for the corporations have none. The university is following that model. And you have to find some way of disrupting that. And one of the ideas that has been talked about a lot is creating a safe space for protest so that you as individuals, that your sacrifice is minimized. And there were a number of ideas for how to do that. Uh, building a network of letter writers within your schools, organizing across schools, um, and perhaps working outside of the university altogether, which could be a, at a national level across the network, but it could also be at a very local level and seeing how you could get people who are not beholden to the university to become your allies. One of the things during the student sit-in sit -in at uh, Columbia that AL mentioned that stopped the police violence, at least for a while, was the fear of Harlem coming to Columbia and setting it on fire. So maybe there are people outside of your university uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement or in the housing justice community that you could work with uh, who are not going to be afraid of going to the university. There's power uh, in numbers. Uh, the other thing I would like to kind of put on the, oh, and I, I very much uh, support the notion of getting faculty involved. Faculty are overloaded, as you are, that universities are being run with contingent labor, very underpaid contingent labor, and the full-time faculty then are doing, I don't know, I, I get up every morning and start working at, at 
nine o'clock and finish at nine o'clock and it never ends. So, you know, they're in your position. They can sympathize with you and they have less to lose than you do. One thing that has not come up that I would like to put on the table is the accreditation process and using that as a wedge. Uh, the schools, you, you have to take some action that will make the schools listen and they all have to go through accreditation. Uh, you know, think about that. How could you use your letter to, as John Lewis said, make good trouble? Just get, you know, get the letters together, send them to the NAB and say, these schools are not properly educating us. We want to see action at the level of accreditation because those people have power over the schools. So go from down under to get on top. So I would consider really how you can, can put some pressure from above on these schools so that they are not intimidating you, so that you are not afraid. I find that just totally reprehensible. Um, and, and if you need help, I'm here. Thank you, Dr. Sutton. I, I, I think that brings us quite nearly to the end of this. Um, um, Mian Nguyen wants to say some, some final concluding um, words. I, I just want to make a quick um, point of advocacy. I'm here representing um, City Tech, which is one of the public colleges. Um, and I think that the faculty there work on fumes. And I'm here because I want to represent them and the students. We're an undergraduate body, and they're working incredibly hard. And two of our most uh, outstanding students uh, one works for Eric Adams and is an advocate for Eric Adams, and the other uh, goes to the Bronx and works for the councilman office. Public policy is a place where they can affect change, and I think that kind of training needs to happen at an undergraduate level because by the time you get to graduate level, there's so many other pressures and you don't know that vocabulary. So um, it's really important for us at City Tech to train our students and to um, create active learning spaces so they can continue to grow and develop the way they want to, not the way that the profession um, mandates through accreditation and all these other metrics. So let me throw to um, Ian, and um, she wants to say a few final words. Um, uh, thanks everyone um, to who has contributed to these efforts. I would like to especially thank Dr. Shannon Sutton for your questions that fuel your research and your tone. Um, thank you especially for modeling the acts of listening and learning and asking insightful questions for us as students, alumni, and faculty members. Um, to close, I would like to uh, echo a sentiment that rose from Amber Wiley in our UVA call to action listening sessions with our administration um, and say that this is not a special interest and we are not a special interest group. Um, all of us have witnessed how quickly cultures can evolve if the needs are clear and individuals accept their responsibilities to change their paradigms. Um, the need to institutionalize advocacy and solidarity with Black lives is clear, and we should leverage everything we, we have wherever we are to make it happen. So I'd like to invite folks to continue this dialogue and these actions with the collective and students um, that will now be taking on the name of this event, New Grounds for Design Education. Uh, we aim to create a network to dismantle white supremacist tactics of isolation and erasure. Um, and the group emerged as an effort to channel our, our actions um, to institutionalize solidarity and advocacy of black lives in all aspects of living. Um, I hope that we can get together and get this done um, locally at our affiliated situ uh, institutions and with the five collaterals, um, that should be six, um, AIA, AIS, ACSA, NAB, NCARB, and should be NOVA. So our first action, actually, I'm very glad to hear that Sharon Sutton um, advice and suggestion. Our first action will be a letter to these organizations. And if you'd like to participate, I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome Aria Hill in closing our discussion. Thank you, Mian, for those powerful words. Uh, and thank you to everyone who participated in this necessary discussion. Um, for far too long, 
Black voices in the design sphere have been disallowed in favor of nourishing the beast that is white supremacy. Our ideas have been overlooked and devalued. Our work has been overlooked and devalued. Our lives have been overlooked and devalued. Yet, we recognize that Black lives matter. Our worth far surpasses the qualifier of matter. Our rich backgrounds are inherently valuable and the work displayed here tonight cannot stop until Black lives are cherished by all. Continue to fight for those who have been and are continually oppressed. The fight for equity will be arduous, but we are privy to the strength and wisdom of those that have come before us. It would be remiss of me not to include some of the Honorable John Lewis's final words on the same day of his homegoing. He says, though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. Thank you and good night. <laughs>